everybody and welcome to the FF Virtual Arena. Now, today, and I'm, I'm quite excited for this one, uh, we're going to be having a we look at the climate crisis, tackling how both corporates and banks can work together to tackle climate change. So, uh, so quite a big topic we're going to cover in the, uh, in the next uh, half hour or so. Joining me uh, today, first of all, a very warm, uh, very warm welcome to Martin Richards, who is the Global Head of Sustainable Finance and the President at HSBC Ventures. Uh, Martin, first of all, how are you today? But also, whereabouts, uh, whereabouts in the world are you? Well, uh, Ali, thanks for having me on. I'm good. Thank you. I'm actually in a rainy London right now. So um, uh, we've definitely got a climate crisis, but you wouldn't know it with the London weather as we sit here right now today. Excellent, excellent. And then also joining us, we have Alex Garkov, who heads up sustainable finance at EcoVadis. Alex, first of all, how are you and where, where in the world are we, uh, are we finding you? Hi there. Uh, yeah, I'm very well, thanks. Also in rainy London. So also loving the, the cloudy weather and rainy weather here. Fantastic. And to round up the panel from SunTech, we have one of their senior vice presidents, Clinton Abbott. Clinton, also in London. And uh, how are you doing today? <laughs> Uh, thanks for having me, guys. Fortunately, not in London, actually in the Southern Africa. So based out of Cape Town. So where you guys have got, unfortunately, the rain aspect, I've got nice sunny weather. Yeah, we'll, we'll definitely do a swap uh, next time we do one of these and we'll, we'll all be down in, uh, in in Cape Town, bring you up to London. <laughs> well, let's let, let's kick, kick things off uh, uh, straight away, because while ESG is becoming quite an important agenda for banks, what are some of the... Um, what are some of the kind of the gaps, the missing links, the things that people often leave to the wayside when it comes to ESG adoption? Uh, Martin, I'm going to go to go to yourself first for this. Yeah, thanks, Ali. Um, you know, ESG is obviously different around the world. There's different uh, government uh, programs, regulations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, whether you're a listed company or not a listed company, our experience is that the large listed companies have sophisticated plans to um, try to reduce their carbon footprint over time. Um, whereas some of the smaller, small and middle-sized companies really are just beginning on that journey. So we uh, try to advise to focus on uh, power, transportation and waste, first of all, and actually um, start improving their position and then move on to more sophisticated things over time. I see that kind of, okay, I, I, I follow that. Uh... Alex, can I get you to, to weigh in here? Much along the same lines as what Martin just said, uh, as a company, Ecovadis is very much focused on helping SMEs and mid-market sized companies uh, start their ESG journey. That's a, a really big focus for us. And that's actually why we've recently partnered with HSBC to, to launch a, a lending program in that space. Um, maybe something else to add here from, from our perspective is, is we really see a big focus on the environment part of ESG. And here at EcoVadis, we're also very much focused on, on ensuring that the other two parts of S and G are, are not forgotten. So I think that may be where you know, the gaps uh, might be in a lot of banks' uh, kind of agenda for sustainability. That's a very good point, actually. It's very easy to kind of get bogged down, obviously, onto the, and into the details on the environmental side and forget the, the uh, S and the G side as well. Yeah, Ali, I, I, I would say that's a very good point of Alex's. Um, you know, we spend a lot of time on the, the climate e side, but um, social and governance is something you absolutely have to do. And particularly as you kind of um, span around the world as we do, you'll find in different markets, uh, social becomes more and more prominent. And that, that's the kind of financing that needs to take place to actually have these companies evolve. Absolutely. Clint, I'm going to get you to, to weigh, in, weigh in here because obviously these things, E, e S, and G, they're not all um, they're not all siloed as well. They're obviously kind of kind of connected uh, connected together. Uh, but Cl Clint, Clinton, over to yourself. Where 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 from your end do you see some of the some of the missing gaps when it comes to ESG adoption? So Ali, I agree with the two gentlemen at the same time. I think it is a balance. So. There has been a very strong driver towards the environmental component, but the SNG, the banks are starting to see how do they take the the deliverables from a board perspective all the way down to a portfolio perspective. So if you look at the products that need to be offered, the loan opportunities and credit lines that are need to be supplied, we see very much on the African continent, how do you actually make sure that the right loans are directed from a DFI or 
from an international funding perspective that those loans are actually allocated to the right people. So when you start looking at the portfolio and product that you need to be able to supply, the data that allocates behind that, make sure that am I meeting the environmental aspect, so the E aspect, so how do I make sure that I am not investing in something that is detrimental to the environment, and that's specifically within like a mining portfolio. So what type of loans am I using for mining versus agriculture and for the right component allocated to that? The S component, which is the social aspect, how do I make sure that the social engagement that fits around all of that, be it that I am now supplying a loan to agriculture, how am I doing a social upliftment of the um, the community, be it women in power, women in leadership, or even um, in the agricultural aspect. And then the G is the governance that ties all that together. So. Have I followed the right loan portfolio aspect? Have I reported on it correctly? Have I given it to the right portfolio and to the right person? And how do I tie it all together to make sure that the commitment that I have from a board perspective is actually implemented right down at a product and implementation to customer perspective? So we see the whole broad band of all of this coming together. It's not just the one vertical as such, all of them interlink very closely together. And banks are starting to see them as an intertwined um, component, not just the E or the S or the G. On that note of various sort of things not being sort of sil siloed away, it, it does seem that maybe 20, 30 years ago, all big organizations, whether it be in finance or wherever, hid behind quite tall walls in terms of the way that they operated. They like to have on-prem data centers, everything was, was in a castle. And now it's those walls are down. It is very much focusing on on partnerships and working and creating that uh, that ecosystem. Hmm. How can banks and corporations and all of the different parts of this ecosystem? How can they work together to achieve their their ESG goals as a, as a whole? And Alex, I'm going to come to you come to you first for this. Thanks. So I think there's two major ways um, that banks or financial institutions can support their customers when it comes to achieving ESG goals. Uh, on the one side, you have kind of an advisory uh, strategy where banks can provide almost, consult almost a consultative service for their customers when it comes to tackling uh, ESG related issues. Um, and on the other side, you have kind of the most important part of what a bank is doing, which is financing their customers and they can use the financial instruments or products they're offering their customers to help those customers achieve their ESG goals, either through uh, kind of an incentive uh, product, which is providing incentives for the customer to make improvements around their ESG performance or ESG management, uh, or by providing financing so that the customer can make uh, changes to their business model or to their operations to have a, an impact, uh, hopefully a positive one, on the world around them, or it can be kind of a combined strategy across all of those uh, different methods I've just described. And I think that's the um, way in which most of the banks are are moving forward. They're they're on the one hand providing that advice, that uh, kind, of, kind of consultative work in in, in a way, um, but also providing the financing to back up uh, those changes that the the corporates need to be doing. And that's something that, <clears throat> from the Ecovadis perspective, you know, we're supporting as well through our. Um, ratings programs that we work on with with some major uh, financial institutions. Fantastic, M Martin. Can I get your your, your thoughts here on that? Uh, yes. uh, that sort of partnership approach. Yes, I mean I would agree with everything Alex said. The the um, addition I would add to that is in our mind there are two kinds of companies. There are our existing portfolio of over 1.3 million companies that we're working with to transition to a net zero future, and that's the kinds of things that Alex discussed. Uh, but on top of that, there's a whole new economy of uh, sustainable infrastructure that needs to be financed and think wind farms, solar arrays, batteries, utility scale, um, and climate tech, new technologies where we're inventing and innovating all the time. And uh, we spend a lot of time focusing with those companies to help them scale, improve and become profitable so they can help the existing portfolio transition. And I think that's the, uh, the add on to uh, what Alex described. I, I like that you mentioned there that with all of these green tech companies, it's not, it's not a charity. If you run them as a business, they will grow and grow. I like that you, you help them to, to reach profit. That's a strong ethos. Um, Clinton, on, on your perspective, where, where do you see these organizations coming together to achieve the goals? 
So I definitely agree with both gentlemen. I think understanding the ecosystem is critical to everybody's success, even to the country or even to the environment that you're dealing with. By building that, call it interlink of the ecosystem and realizing the more I contribute to sustainability by working together, that's how I do the social upliftment as well as call it the environmental um, upliftment. So I use an example whereby if I am understanding that whole finance aspect that Alex had referenced, and I can make sure that each tranche within that financing component is actually used by other parties within that environment, be it the transport mechanisms that I'm using for moving my uh, grain from point A to point B, my milling process that I take place, am I using solar energy that's allocated to that? Each part of that, call it leg in the process, allows me to actually show the benefits to the whole ecosystem. So if you are utilizing the following um, agricultural products that are using sustainable uh, mechanisms, if you are using the transport capability, it's focusing towards net zero, and I'm working with a mill that is actually utilized in solar energy, I can have those carbon credits that can actually be allocated to me as an off-end producer or even as a producer of the capability. So being part of the ecosystem is a benefit, not only from a financial and I mean, not only from a social upliftment perspective, beneficial, but also from a financial upliftment. So I can get reduced risk with regards to my loans because I've got underwriting because I'm utilizing green energy. I have got the proper tracing and trackability between all of this because I can actually identify each process in the step and I've priced the entire transaction legs end to end. So I know exactly everything that took place in that fulfillment. And that's how you do ecosystem upliftment in our perspective is having all of that coming together. That's a very, a very good point. I'm going to uh, brag slightly as a uh, as a magazine. Well, I say brag. I haven't actually pulled the trigger on it yet. As a, as a magazine publisher, we've just changed our printing to be on vegetable oils, recycled paper, and uh, um, the electricity for actually printing is from a wind farm. And I was looking at the different types of paper. I can't tell the difference between it. Mm. And the... Um, the one with the, which comes with a nice uh, ESG tracking is actually about 15% cheaper than what I was doing before. So, uh, yeah, it w- works out all kind of quids in following every everything back in the uh, back in the trail. Uh, Ali, I, I actually think that's a really key point. Um, 10, 15 years ago, if you wanted to go green, uh, you really had to pay kind of a green premium um, to pay more for the same service. Now, with the evolution of technology and uh, the cost curve, you can actually, um, you know, buy an electric car, uh, put a heat pump in place, and do all kinds of things as you described that would um, not only be good for the planet but also be good for your business economically. Mark, I've got a question for you off the off the back of that, which is because ESG is becoming such a an increasingly an important agenda for banks. Um, when it comes to actual adoption with some of your clients, what what are some of the the holding points? What are some of the gaps for actual ESG adoption with some of these some of these businesses? In the situations that I just described, where it's a um, economically uh, beneficial to to put those in, put those technologies in place, I would say it's all about capital and business models. Um, you know, we want to finance companies that. Uh, you know, maybe don't have enough uh, capital to electrify their fleet, but over the, the life of the fleet would actually be a much more economic um, instance to have an electric fleet. So there's a lot of capital going into those, what I would say is proven technologies um, to be able to electrify everything and then make sure that that power is green power. Um, then on the earlier stage technologies, uh, thinking things like direct air capture, long duration storage, green hydrogen, um, there's a lot of lab uh, proven technologies that need to make the hop to be commercial scale. And in that space, um, we're seeing a lot of capital being deployed in kind of a, um, a blended structure 
where you may have a venture capital company coming in with a bank on top. You may have a, a government giving a grant or a guarantee uh, with debt financing on top. And that's really kind of how we're accelerating the uh, innovation part. It's, it's both a race to deploy as fast as possible existing technologies and innovate new technologies as fast as possible. And then not take as long as we did getting solar and wind out there to the extent we've done already. Uh, we've, we've got to do things faster and faster. Absolutely. Um, Alex, I've got a, a question for, for yourself, and this is one of those ones that can be an in interesting response. I, I want to talk about uh, ratings. Um, wait, let's, talk, let's just kind of delve into how important the use of ESG ratings are to ensure that there's kind of a, a manageable score and that there's no level of kind of, of, of greenwashing. What, what are some of the, the benefits around utilizing ESG scores for society at large? Well, I guess I'm a, gonna be a little bit biased here because I do work at an ESG ratings company, but I'll, I'll give you my perspective. Um, so I, I would say that <clears throat> right now there's there's a huge kind of difference in terms of the different types and kinds of ESG ratings you can find out there. There's no not a lot of standardization within the industry. Um, and you've got some uh, providers who are focused more, uh, in fact, most ESG rating providers in financial services are, are focused more on the larger corporates, the listed companies, um, and they're usually using uh, publicly available information to uh, produce their ratings and then they kind of sell them as a data set. Um, whereas at Ecovadis here, we're focused more on the smaller end of the market by and we work to produce our ratings by engaging with the companies directly to get kind of access to their internal information and systems to produce what we hope is a pretty accurate rating uh, or indicator of their ESG management and ESG performance over time. Um, so I think there is a certainly a role to play for, for different types of ratings, especially in the area of financing, um, especially when it comes to the, the idea of greenwashing, right? Because usually the rating providers are assessing a company independently uh, with no conflicts of interest in terms of providing a good or, or worse rating. Um, and so that's kind of the role I see ESG uh, ratings playing in the financial services industry. It's providing that third party verification almost of a company's performance when it comes to ESG. Uh, something else that ratings companies can can, can also do and something that Ecovadis does is kind of helping companies uh, increase or improve rather their performance in terms of ESG management, in terms of ESG performance as well, by providing uh, feedback uh, from each assessment. Um, because obviously to conduct or to produce rather uh, an ESG rating for a company, you do need to look at what a company is actually doing, what performance the company is actually uh, publishing uh, right now uh, to assess that ESG performance. I think the the role of, of ratings is, can, can be quite important, can be quite crucial as that kind of a step between maybe a full audit um, and uh, simply looking at a company's own report. So I think that's uh, my view on that subject. <laughs> And uh, also, Ali, yeah. I, I don't work for Echo Artists, but let me give a plug if I can for um, ESG rating companies. Um, what we found is it's very difficult to change and improve unless you start off with measuring. So um, you really got to start off with measuring the things you want to change and then manage those changes and hopefully, uh, you know, report improvement. Um, but without that first step, um, you're kind of really shooting in the dark. Yeah, that's actually a great point and something I always say, and at least with Ecovadis ratings, but I would probably say the same would apply for any ratings uh, methodology is that there should be no good or bad rating at the start. The idea is simply to provide that transparency as a baseline to then benchmark performance in the future. I'm going to steal that for a spine quote. That's a great line. That's a great line. Uh, uh, Clinton, can I get your, your take here on ESG ratings and how, how, they, how they should and could be used, but also how kind of far back up the chain you want to go? So thanks. Uh, I totally agree with both gentlemen. I think I, I come from a very deep banker background. So branch banking all the way through to um, equity investment into banks and looking at the nightmare in actually understanding the portfolio and the data that goes into it. Having ratings agencies like Ecovadis that can actually provide their transparency just helps the bank to better understand their customer. I think you've always had like a very strong risk focus towards credit risk. Am I going out and looking at the, the customer that I'm dealing with? Does he have sufficient assets to underwrite the loan that he's taking? That's more the approach that he's taken. You don't really understand the back end operations. How does the, the whole call it governance structures work? Are they doing the right thing? Do they do 
the do they run the company in the right manner you kind of rely very much on the balance sheet income statement to actually work that out but having somebody that can actually look at the other side of the customer so the non-financial aspect and being able to have that insight i think two things can happen you can build your ecosystem more effectively because you know customers that fall within certain aspects and not just relying on the industry sector code like most banks do but actually truly understanding what that organization does and how they do it i think it allows you also the ability to do better cross sale into those organizations and also to de-risk your portfolio because you really understand what the true risk of your underlying portfolio is being able to get funding through other mechanisms to de-risk it as well gives you that transparency all the way through with ratings agency inclusive so i'm a big advocate of it i think it's really something that aids um, organizations as a whole and should be actually integrated directly into the risk portfolio from the offset so you when i'm actually originating the customer i'm doing that checkpoint already and i'm really trying to help the customer to to govern the right way so yeah i really appreciate them um alex i want to come to you with this how can esg success be measured I will be biased again and, and just say that his ratings are a great way to measure ESG performance and management and success over time. But um, more specifically, and to answer the question, I think traditionally we we there's been a big focus on some specific KPIs, and certainly a lot of the regulation that's coming down the pipeline uh, from the EU, um, but also globally, is focused on very specific um, kind of standardized uh, KPIs around carbon emissions, around waste, uh, etc notably SFDR, which is coming into play um, this year. We're uh, here at Ecovadis, our perspective is that we we need to collect those KPIs, but also there should be a focus kind of on a more holistic ESG management as well. And that's you know, part of what our rating programs are doing, but also it, it, it's more of a, a, a holistic, qualitative way to help companies enhance, uh, improve and change their policies, um, which can have then a real impact on the way that they um, are acting in the market and their their how those activities then influence what those KPIs are, right? So behind all of those KPIs, behind all of those numbers is uh, kind of should be, uh, let's say, a focus on policies and management in a more holistic manner. Um, and that's uh, kind of, I guess, my perspective of here, here at EcoVadis. Um, obviously, we're starting to see it's, it's no longer just a big corporate. It's also some of the smaller businesses, SMEs, are starting to utilize options to reduce their environmental impact. Um, what, what's happening in this space and also with all the various climate tech out there and a variety of venture capital, what's happening? Uh, and Martin, I'd love your take on this. What, what's happening in the climate tech VC world at the moment? Um, it's, it's, a, it's a frothy market. Um, overall, uh, venture capital into the climate tech space was down a little in 2022, a couple of percentage. Um, but it was down significantly in the growth late stage, about 25%, and up 60% in the early stage. So a lot of money still going into innovation. Overall, $40 billion went into climate tech in 2022, and that funded over a thousand companies. Um, so the actual count of companies was up significantly, up 40%. Um, so we're seeing uh, valuations on late stage come down a little bit in line with the public markets but interest in small and innovative companies that are coming to the market with new technologies is just growing and growing and growing. So, uh, you know, a great time for the market and a great time for uh, both innovators and financiers. Uh, Alex, can I get your, your take here, please? Um, we're, we're not so focused, let's say, in the, in the VC markets, uh, but we do have a huge focus on the SME uh, kind of segment of the market in terms of helping them provide the transparency around their current ESG management and helping them uh, through an improvement plan, let's call it. Um, that's, a, that's a real big focus of EcoVadis um, because we see that as the biggest gap in the marketplace right now. Um, there's a lot of focus on the larger listed companies, as, as Martin alluded to at the beginning of this conversation um, but where there's the most work to be done is probably in the mid-market and smaller SME segment of the market and that's where the EcoVadis program can perhaps provide the most value for these kinds of companies through the ratings but also really through the assessments and the results that we provide which includes an action plan to help those companies start to make changes in their policies start to make changes in the way they act um, and to start to track certain of those kind of more traditional ESG related KPIs as well so that they can and provide those results with their trading partners, with their bank, perhaps 
um, so that they can, uh, you know, really formalize what they're doing around ESG and also begin to fulfill some of their regulatory reporting requirements that may be coming down the pipeline as well. And, and Ali, maybe I could give a, another perspective of why this is so important for SMEs. Um, most SMEs will sell to larger companies. They're going to be in the supply chain of larger public listed companies. Those listed public companies are not only addressing their scope one and scope two emissions, but they're also looking at scope three, which is their own supply chain. And therefore, um, small businesses have to um, you know, decrease their carbon footprint, not just for themselves, but so they can participate in the supply chain and be part of the scope three emissions of the largest company. So even if regulation hasn't come to you yet, um, your buyers will be bringing that regulation to you, and it's something you need to focus on, even at the very smallest end of the scale, end of the market. Clinton, can I can I go to your self, please? Around because there again, there's a lot of interesting work in in climate tech, um, mm. both for SMEs and corporates. So, so what are some of the options out there that SMEs and small businesses should be should be looking at to reduce their environmental impact? I go back to what Alex had spoken about, and I really resonate with that. Understanding that that whole supply chain and the not just the supply chain, the value chain that's allocated to it, because people are part of a supply chain to gain value. So understanding what value are you attributing to it from a financial or non-financial aspect is something that we're starting to see a big drive within organizations. So being able to take that SME and say to them, how do I help you know, not just from a, a funding perspective, but how do I help engage and be able to convert you into being able to meet the objectives that are risks that you might not even know about with regards to um, zero emissions with your buying that power that you need to be able to meet. All of those are conversation points that banks can have with their customers to be able to say, I can help you get better finance and underwriting from a de-risk perspective because I can allocate this as a transition loan from this part of your business to move you into green energy. So being able to have solar power and be able to get the, the tax benefits behind it as well as called the funding benefits, the banks can actually assist their customers to work better with that. At the same time, because you've got the insights of that customer, you can also start expanding to build an ecosystem between those customers. So like-minded support groups being able to help with upliftment of knowledge. At the same time, identifying other supply chains where they can also interlink with. And then you can give discount pricing or even free transactions by trying to grow that ecosystem to be able to uplift that portfolio specifically. So. If you stay within the portfolio, you use certain payment mechanisms and you are also assisting the organization to meet their targets. Remember, it's not just that the SME has targets to meet themselves. Banks from a funding perspective also have to meet certain targets to be able to ensure that their funding and shareholder levels are also met. So being able to help that low level SME to be able to meet the portfolio component, to be able to meet the shareholder expectation and naturally the market expectation, all of that data and interlink between it is where we're really seeing tech upliftment coming into play. So being able to say, how do I understand that customer? How do I understand that portfolio? What is that benefit of that transaction going left or right? So if I had to choose this supplier versus that supplier, what is the difference in benefit that I would be able to attribute to and look at the long-term benefit? So exactly like you had spoken about your magazine, you don't see the difference today because you actually have been shown, you weren't shown the, the alternatives. By now seeing alternatives, touching, feeling, and seeing that the paper is the exact same and it's cheaper, it opens up a whole different avenue of engagement for you. So it comes down to knowledge. It comes down to presentation. It comes down to expanding the, the ecosystem through like-minded individuals and financing options. On to the subject of financing options, what, what, um, what can banks, uh, specifically HSBC, what can you be doing to help to incentivize organizations to reduce their environmental uh, impact? What, what are you guys at HSBC doing in this space? Um, I would say it's, it's generally in, in two areas. Uh, one on the financing side, Ali, we will do uh, venture debt financing, early stage venture debt financing for climate tech companies, um, all the way through uh, infrastructure financing for large projects uh, for non-climate companies 
will do um, sustainably linked loans or green loans to allow them to um, uh, purchase and execute on their strategies of uh, clean power, um, better transportation, lower waste. Um, and then on the, on the, 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 it isn't financing, but what we're trying to do is I would say twofold. Um, we've talked about smaller enterprises, um, not having huge teams to help them decarbonize. What we're doing is taking best practices from our largest clients and where it's a Appropriate and where it's an industry significant, we will take those ideas to our smaller clients and help them up the uh, knowledge curve. And then secondarily, um, as those larger global companies try to uh, decarbonize, we're taking our climate tech companies that have new technologies addressing hard to evade sectors. And we're taking that technology to those largest companies and helping them both the climate tech companies scale and the large companies transition. So I think those are probably the two areas where we're most active. Absolutely. Now, Clinton, what, what about you guys at Suntech? What, what are you doing uh, in this in, in this uh, space when it comes to, well, as well, integrating some ESG data? So very much what Alex had spoken about. We go a, a lot deeper um, because our solution, we're one, we're one of the world's leading, if not the world's leading, pricing and billing um, engine. So our ability to actually build deals specifically structured for the customer according to each of those commitment parameters that Alex had alluded to. Our solutions have the ability to put any of those level of commitments or tracking mechanisms that need to be put into place. So you can take a, a debt financing deal or you can, let's just take an, an arbitrary um, loan facility that I put down. Instead of looking at just the payoff facility, I can actually have discount from an interest perspective, if I actually meet certain objectives. So if I reduce my carbon um, component over the next year by putting solar financing in to my organization, you get a 2% reduction on your, your interest component. If I meet X, Y, and Z additional um, criteria, so I do $100,000 of payments through other uh, mechanisms that are also working on meeting zero emission goals, I also get a discount on that pricing. Those payments are free, for example, or I can have a 50% discount on my SWIFT transfers because I'm actually utilizing the, the opportunities that the bank provides me with because I'm trying to uplift my portfolio. I'm trying to uplift the bank's portfolio. And having all of that that is digitized and managed automatically, it's not a case of you know, a person coming and sitting in front of you and say, well, I haven't really met my targets. You know, give me still the discount. I'll meet them next month. You either meet it or you don't. So being able to make sure that all parties are aligned, be it the customer, the bank, call it even the commitment to market or commitment to to the industry. If you meet all of that, the customer benefits, the bank benefits, and everybody walks away from a benefits perspective. So you don't have revenue leakage. You don't have, you know, customers that are saying, but I did meet the targets and you didn't provide me with the benefits. You've got a physical, call it invoice that has got your ESG scoring to say you've met the following criteria. So we've taken it quite a few steps further. We've seen, you know, Understanding how loyalty is actually utilized in different mechanisms. If I take each of these components and I pull them together, I can track all of that under a single commitment for an organization. So though banks have not been traditionally playing in these spaces, very much a deal was you know, a gentleman sitting across the table, typing up a contract, signing the contract, and five years later, we reevaluate it again. These are tracking mechanisms that are actually physically happening in real time now. And you don't have to worry about, you know, is somebody keeping an eye on it? It's actually physically managed um, and you're meeting all of the objectives. So we see in a very much a shift towards how do you build that call it product of one or segment of one. So not just am I dealing with the SME, how am I making sure that the SME grows and that deal that I'm structuring is very, very specific to them and be able to meet their objectives. And when you expand that to the wider ecosystem, word of mouth comes into play. So you have many of these ecosystem um, teams that actually start talking about what is it that their banks are doing for them and the benefits that they're achieving. And that's kind of how you're starting to see these banks starting to extend their opportunities across other um, areas. So it's a big driver for us and we've seen from a global perspective. Absolutely. Well, the last thing I want to throw over to uh, everyone, um, 
I'm going to go to you first, Alex. Ask the question, Alex. Off, uh, off the back of, uh, off the back of that, Martin. How do you feel that success can be measured on uh, on ESG initiatives? Uh, bottom, bottom line, at the end of the day, Ali, it's going to come down to how close we get to our 1.5% uh, commitment on um, rising temperature. Um, between here and there, um, every company, uh, every bank, and every country is going to have to um, do more uh, for us to meet that commitment. Um, we are we, we feel like it's a huge opportunity, quite frankly. Um, the, the whole world's economy is going to get restructured as we get closer and closer to net zero and all banks have to be involved in this. In the short term, um, I think it's basically each company and we I like to talk a little bit about setting certain goals and meeting those goals. And it's really kind of um, meeting those goals in the short term with a plan, an effective plan and a reasonable plan to make your longer term goals. Um, You've got to have a plan to get to net zero, but you've also got to have steps that take you on that path and be actually executing on those steps. And uh, and Clinton, from, from your perspective, lastly, how, how do you feel that uh, uh, success can be measured on, on ESG initiatives? So I think there's a lot of data points that are available um, in an organization. And I agree with where Martin, what Martin says. But at the same time, the growth of the organization, the data elements and points that they've got, they have to fundamentally change how they measure certain things. So, you know, having the board that actually agrees on meeting the SDG goals and these are the um, conformance issues that we will provide, these are the portfolio aspects that we need to meet, how that translates all the way down to the low end deal maker or the customer consultant in the branch that needs to be able to deliver to that customer, getting that translation right, that that person can speak to the goals of the organization will be the true test of measure. You know, talking about ESG is one thing, the implementation and realization of it right through the whole organization and being able to track and trace it more effectively, I think is something that that will really be a test of measure. I, I've seen it in on the continent you know, in Africa where DFI funding has really pushed the reporting requirements for many of the banks that rely on international funding that have to meet those ESG um, goals. Being able to get that level of reporting out, they're starting to see checkpoints of how they've been able to grow and how they've been able to benefit as organizations in meeting not just their DFI targets, but also meeting their own ESG targets. So I think more that people talk about it, the more that it becomes a realized opportunity, not just you know the ESG nice little logo that we've actually met it and all the United Nations sustainability goals are ticked, but that we can physically tangibly taste and realize it. And I use your reference again about your piece of paper. When you can physically see the difference that you're making as an individual, then you know that you're making a difference as an organization. And I think that's the translation that we have to get to is it's not necessarily a dollars and pounds measure. It's an acceptance level that we need to make a difference as as the globe. Guys, thank you all so much for taking the taking the time to to speak with us today. Martin, where, where where can we find you? Do you have a, do you have a be real account? Um, I, I'm not on TikTok or any of the uh, regular social media sites. Um, I am on LinkedIn, and you can also find me at martinrichards at hsbc.com. Alex, where where best to find out more about yourself? What's your what's your TikTok channel? <laughs> I, I unfortunately don't have a TikTok channel, but you can uh, find me um, by going to ecovadis.com um, and filling out our form there or on LinkedIn. Um, as well as my uh, professional e Ecovadis email as well, which is agarkov at ecovadis.com. And uh, thank you all so much for the conversation today. It was very much a pleasure. And uh, Clinton, lastly, where, where can we find out more about yourself? Um, on LinkedIn, so Clinton Abbott uh, at LinkedIn, and then also ClintonCA at suntechgroup.com. Excellent, guys. Thank you all much for your time. Well, uh, I've been uh, Ali Patterson from FF News. We will see you all very, very soon.